Martin to Bolton then. And I won't tell you any more about Charles' background. <laughs> At least not before the talk. Um, he's had quite a sustained link with the Jesuits because before his present appointment, which is at Roehampton University, he taught at Ethrock. In fact, he ended up being head of the theology department, which for those of us who had to deal with Ethrock will know that was a very mixed blessing. <laughs> he now finds himself talking in front of his, one of his former colleagues, and his former principal has just come in the room. It's just one of those things, but he's moved on. <laughs> This theology and ecology conversation, which somehow has become very fashionable since Laudato Si, Martin was involved in before. He's not just climbed on a bandwagon. His doctoral thesis was in this area. His first published book also in this area. By way of introduction, that's almost everything except to say, I know Martin because I'm helping to develop an MA program. The Jesuits have co-created an MA program in theology, ecology, and ethics. We've co-created it with the University of Roehampton, where purely coincidentally, Martin is the based man. <laughs> so one way or another, he's finding it very difficult to get away from Jesuits. It happens. Having been a Jesuit for four hundred years, I understand how difficult it can be for people to give us up. It's a very bad habit to get into. But there you go. So there's nothing else I need to say. So I'll hand over to Martin. Thank you, Eddie. Uh, so Eddie, Eddie has given you already one reason why the subtitle for today's address is what it is. More of that later. And the reason for the main title of it is Laudato Si related. So what I'm going to do is take us through some pertinent parts of Laudato Si in order to investigate at the same time care for our common law and how theology, ecology and ethics might be able to work together in order to allow us better to care for our common law. There's been quite a bit of debate since the publication of Laudato C about what kind of an encyclical it is. I remember in 2015-16 in particular, there was a lot of debate about whether it was an eco encyclical. And some people said, yes it is, because it's obviously about ecological matters. Other people said, no it's not, because it's part of Catholic social teaching, and Catholic social teaching is interested in other things as well as ecology. My own take on that is to ask, well, what words might be involved in this that begin with eco? After all, ecology begins with the eco. But so does economics. And in fact, the term ecology and economics comes from an earlier tradition, before modernity got hold of these prefixes and used them. In fact, the term economy comes from a Christian tradition. Early Christian theologians used it to talk about salvation, drawing on the way in which God dealt with, organised, and gave wars to what might be called the household, an oikos. So it seems to me that approach that way Laudato C offers us plenty of resources for looking at ecology, economics, theology, salvation, good life, and our relationship with God. 
And that's the angle that I want to come at it from this evening. Because doing so helps us to understand that what Francis has in mind is a particular spirit, a particular way of approaching things that allows us to draw all these supposedly diverse, supposedly even sometimes diametrically opposed ways of thinking and acting and working in our human world. He's offering us a relational spirit with which to approach these things. And there's a few bits of what I will see that I think are particularly pertinent in helping us to discover this relational spirit. One of them is the now famous expression, which he's used a number of times before and since, everything is connected. On my various trips up to Bolton recently, as I stood on platform 14 of Manchester Piccadilly Station, waiting for the train to Bolton, there's a building opposite, just between the station and uh, what used to be called in my old, my, my youth, Unist. And one of the most recent additions to that building is a sign over a door, which says everything is connected. And I've been quite drawn to this building as it's, as it's grown and developed and different things have appeared on it. Because that saying is hatching on beyond the church. Because everything is connected. As Pope Francis himself goes on to say in Bible I see, concern for the environment needs to be joined to a sincere love for our fellow human beings and an unwavering commitment to resolving the problems of society. So already we have environmental concerns, concerns for human life and human flourishing, and concerns for societies brought into relationship with each other. Slightly earlier in my mental see, when Pope Francis is looking at the scriptural tradition, and he looks at the two Genesis stories of creation, he says this, the creation accounts in the book of Genesis contain, in their own symbolic and narrative language, profound teachings about human existence and its historical reality. They suggest that human life is grounded in three fundamental and closely intertwined relationships with God, with our neighbour, and with the earth itself. This adds another layer of relationality onto the one which I've already touched on. Because what it claims is that the Christian understanding that our relationship with God is central to our lives is something that can be beneficial to current debates about how we care for our common home. That was certainly recognised at the Paris COP in 2015. I went there with a group from Capo, and one of the things that I remember most about that trip is the day that we actually went to the venue where the COP was finishing, it was I think the day before it finished. And delegate after delegate after delegate came over to us because we were quite well capitalized, we were very visible, and said to us, thank you for that out of sea because it has been significant in these talks. People of faith have a profound contribution to make to this debate. You're not peripheral, you're right at the centre. And that's important that you remember that. It's something I've carried with me since. When Pope Francis in Mergant C goes on to talk about his big idea, integral ecology, he does it in quite a complex way, and you might breathe a sigh of relief at this point to know I'm not going to lead you through the whole of the section. There's too much of it. But I am going to look with you briefly at the very first section, because again, it adds another layer to this relational picture that I'm seeking to build up. Because the first section talks about environmental, economic, and social ecology. In a sense, this is a reprise of what he said in the first 
excerpt that I use. We are faced, he says, not with two separate crises, one environmental and the other social, but rather with one complex crisis, which is both social and environmental. Strategies for a solution demand an integrated approach to combating poverty, restoring dignity to the excluded, and at the same time, protecting nature. Another threefold integration that we can layer with the other ones. Or perhaps, to use a slightly different language, maybe we need to find a three-dimensional way of relating these to each other. Rather than building them on top of each other in a two-dimensional picture, maybe a three-dimensional picture will help us with the growing complexity that Francis is putting together in Laudato Si. How do you do this? I think you do it by going back to Evangelii Gaudium. Because in Evangelii Gaudium, Pope Francis suggests a three-dimensional image to use. And I think it's this image that he is suggesting to us to look at the complexity that he's built up in Laudato Si. It's the image of the polyhedron. And he uses it in Evangelii Gaudium as a way of putting across the way in which he's trying to build up <coughs> a picture of, the, of how Christians, how Catholic Christians in particular, can engage in the issues that they, we need to engage in in our contemporary world. This is what he says about it. Our model is not the sphere, which is no greater than its parts, where every point is equidistant from the centre and there are no differences between them. Instead, it is the polyhedron, which reflects the convergence of all of its parts, each of which preserves its distinctiveness. The problem, I think, that Francis is articulating here is that using a three-dimensional image like a sphere leaves us with a lowest common denominator approach. So, if you're coming into the debate from, for example, an economic point of view, there is a temptation, and I use that word a little bit, there is a temptation to try to translate all of the other points of view into economic terms. And to say, this is the analysis which is the best analysis. Hardly surprising then. If you are in a debate with someone who's coming at it from an ecological point of view, and they're doing the same thing as you are, trying to reduce everything down to an ecological standpoint, then you are going to end up in an intractable situation in which you hit the economic challenges and the environmental challenges against one another as competing explanations, because you're trying to bring it all down to one dominant way of addressing the issues. What Francis is proposing instead is a debate in which many take part. Each of those <coughs> has something to contribute to the debate, and the debate is not more complex and complicated and harder the more faces there are, it's actually more complete. It's got more possibility of moving forward the more faces there are, as long as the participants in the debate are willing to admit that they have part of the picture, not the whole picture. Because if you are willing to admit that you have part of the picture, then two things become possible. I think this is what the image of the polyhedron is meant to help us to understand. One is that your part of the picture is an important part, and the picture isn't complete without it. Second is that your point of view needs other points of view to be able to come to a common solution for our common problem. If any of the faces is lost, the polyhedron is not complete. The complexity 
is actually part of the solution. It's not a problem for finding the solution. That, I think, is an unusual, brave, and potentially debate changing way of understanding the debate. And it's something that I think we could gain from enormously as time goes on. I suspect that the contribution that integral ecology and other ideas in Laudato Si are making to our Catholic social tradition will only become apparent as years pass, as we come to understand its significance. One of the things that can help with that is trying to come to grips with what is on it, education. Or perhaps to use a title that I became familiar with in my time at EGOP, the intellectual apostolate, if you understand it as a ministry, as the Society of Jesus does. There is a nobility, says Francis, in the duty to care for creation through little daily actions. And it is wonderful how education can bring about real changes in lifestyle. Changing the way that we think can play a role in changing the way that we behave. And if we reflect on how we behave, that can change our attitudes, which in turn can change our behaviour again. This integral approach to action, learning, reflection, decision making, is at least one way of understanding the practice of discernment. A term which, again, I have become more and more familiar with, the more and more I am associated with the Society of Jesus. And Francis gives us an important way of understanding this. It's not just a tool for spiritual development. It is that, but it's more than that. It's not just something which is idle speculation. It's much more than that. We must not think, he says in the next paragraph, that these efforts are not going to change the world. Making small incremental changes can make a difference if we do it in this integral, integrated way. So what's that got to do then with theology, ecology, and ethics. Well, my link in part is education, because as you heard from Eddie at the beginning of this evening, there is an educational end in sight in this input. These are indeed the three words that are used to describe the new MA that the University of Wolverhampton and the Society of Jesus have co-created. And so what I want to do towards the end now is is to reflect a little on how these three distinct, some might even say, very different areas of theoretical endeavour might be used in the kind of way that I've been speaking about so far this evening. And to start with an education quote, to keep the education flavour going explicitly in the first thing I want to say. Here's what Pope Francis says later on in that article C about what could happen if environmental education was placed into a constructive and helpful dialogue with theological and spiritual education. Environmental education, he says, should facilitate making the leap towards the transcendent, which gives ecological ethics its deepest meaning. It needs educators capable of developing an ethics of ecology and helping people through effective pedagogy to grow in solidarity, responsibility, and compassionate care. That's a contribution, I believe, that theology and spirituality can make to ecology. I'm working with a doctoral students at the moment at Roehampton who's engaged in a project which is about this, putting environmental education into dialogue with theology and spirituality. 
to try to enrich both. Because it's not a one-way process. Part of the idea of the polyhedron is to contribute and also to grow. That you grow together. It's not a case that your <coughs> point of view is the best point of view, and it's the only one that you need to resource. You also need to offer something to others and to learn from others. It's a, it's a give and take situation. We need an ethics of ecology. Those two disciplines need to enter into a constructive into a relationship as well. Because it can help us to grow in those three ideas that Pope Francis mentions at the end, which are key, aren't they, to the Catholic social tradition. Solidarity, responsibility, compassionate care. <laughs> The next thing I want to talk about a little bit is the relationship between change and conversion. And the fact that this uh, input is happening in Lent, I think, is appropriate too for that, as we reflect on that conversion that we are all called to as we journey through the Lent and the <coughs> towards the celebration of Easter. The ecological crisis, says Francis, is also a summons to a profound interior conversion. Living our vocation to be protectors of God's handiwork is essential to the life of virtue. It is not an optional or secondary aspect of our Christian experience. So, if theology and spirituality are able to enter into this kind of mutual constructive dialogue that Francis is inviting us to, then those disciplines and people who practice those disciplines and people whose lives are shaped around the values of those disciplines, Catholic Christians among them, have a great deal to learn from ecology and the way that ecology is trying to care for our common home. I have a great deal to learn from ethics, and not necessarily just theological ethics. Philosophical ethics will have a lot to offer in a project like this. Other forms of ethics, sociological ones, anthropological ones, will have a great deal to offer, because the great thing about a polyhedron, as this says, is that in a polyhedron, the whole can be, if you approach it right, the whole can be greater than the sum of its parts. It's not just that you have something to learn from the other ways of, of approaching the issues, it's that all of you can <coughs> become better at what you're doing. So the ecologist can become a better ecologist, the ethicist can become a better ethicist, the theologian can become a better theologian as a result of this dialogue and this interchange and this exchange and this mutual complex, yes, way of trying to address the issues which are commonly shared. The final thing that I want to just talk a little bit about is the way that, really towards the end of the article soon now, Pope Francis talks about mysticism. The universe, he says, unfolds in God, who fills it completely. Hence, there is a mystical meaning to be found in a leaf, in a mountain tree, in a dewdrop in a poor person's face. The ideal is not only to pass from the exterior to the interior to discover the action of God in the soul, but also to discover God in all things. There's a number of things going on here that make this little excerpt from paragraph 233 interesting for me. One of them is that what Francis is not proposing is a dewy-eyed, rose-tinted spectacles form of nature mysticism. That's not what he's doing. Therefore, he deliberately 
lists as the things in which a mystical meaning can be found, a leaf, a mountain trail, a dewdrop. Well, so far we are a bit giddy-eyed if we, if we want to read it that way. And people do. And then Francis adds in a poor person's face, in someone whose life is hard, in someone who is struggling, this is not blind, dewy eye, rose tinted spectacles approach to the world. It is combining two things, which I think Francis does incredibly well in his own personal witness, and which I think are important in this area. It combines a joy. <clears throat> which is his starting point, and that's where he starts with that also from. You shouldn't approach the world primarily as a problem to be solved, he says. So at the beginning of my office, the world is a gift. <coughs> so the appropriate first step is joy. But joy is not the same thing as refusing to see problems. You have to combine it with a healthy realism that looks at the world and says, one of the other most famous bits of Laudato Si, that the world that we live in is coming more and more to resemble an immense pile of filth, because it is looked at in another way. And you have to find a way of holding those two things together. That's not easy. But remember the Polynesian. He's inviting us to a more complex way of integrating our understanding and our relationship to and our way of seeing and responding to our common home. Holding together in a critical way, it seems to me. Not just a rosy way or a, or a way that says, oh, everything's terrible. This isn't a glass half full, glass <coughs> half empty approach. Some people are optimists and some people are pessimists. No, he's inviting us to a deeper analysis, a more critical analysis, one that I would call an interaction between a critical positivity that sees the good and rejoices in it as gift from God, and at the same time sees the way that the world is full of problems, some of which at least we have caused. Climate change is at least in part anthropogenic. And to hold those two things together, that's a difficult thing to do. And quite often it's done in a good deal of tension. But I think what Francis is inviting us to is a method of analysis, a method of response, a method of working together in which we try to hold together these various, what are often thought to be competing analyses in the way in which they can all contribute to the task of caring for our common poor. Because in terms of spirituality, and that's what I think the last bit of the quote is about, in terms of spirituality, the task that faces us is not only, not, notice the only, he's not saying it's not at all to pass from the exterior to the interior. It is that. <laughs> there is a sense in which we are indeed called through the practice of spirituality, through the practice of discernment, through our interaction with our people, to grow spiritually as people in relationship with God. Don't forget that this last part of Laudato Si is addressed to Christians. It is addressed to us. But it's not only that. Partly because, if it is that, it risks looking like escapism. It risks looking like a denial of the role that Christians can play in the transformation of the world. It looks like turning your back on problems, interiorizing them, and treating them as only about your relationship with God. And that's one of the things it's about, but it's only one. As Genesis told us, 
our responsibility is about an intertwining of three relationships with God, with our fellow human beings, and with the earth itself. A more complex analysis is actually what we need. So what else do we do? It's not just about passing from the exterior to the interior in order to discover the action of the soul, it is that, but it is also about discovering God in all things. God is not only to be found in our interior life. God is to be found in our interior life, but not only in our interior life. And as a good Jesuit, Francis draws on the Jesuit tradition of finding God in all things to express that. <laughs> Those of us, including myself, who aren't Jesuits, I'm misleading Don Bosco, might find other ways of articulating that. But that's a good thing. Because the more ways in which we can articulate it, the more in which distinctive traditions within the Roman Catholic Church can come together, drawing on their own background, coming into a mutual constructive engagement about these issues, a more complex response is a more adequate response the following injury. So what he's inviting us to do, I think, is to bring into dialogue with each other in our lives, in our education, in our ways of working, in our thinking, contributions from distinctive places within our lives to allow economics to dialogue effectively and really with ecology, to allow theology <coughs> to dialogue with ecology in a way that can be mutually helpful, also to deal with, to dialogue with ethics in ways that are mutually helpful, for ecology and ethics to enter into constructive mutual dialogue. And that's one of the things that we are hoping will be able to be done in a new MA, which, as Eddie said at the beginning before, before I started, we have uh, co-created with the Society of Jesus and the University of Northampton, and which will be, be start to be delivered in September. Theology, Ecology and Ethics is the title of the MA. It also includes multidisciplinary aspects, as I've been talking about today, beyond those three disciplines and brings them to the table as well, brings them to the dialogue as well. It also involves philosophy, wanting to bring that to the dialogue as well, because the rationale that we're working with is this rationale of Pope Francis. That in fact, a more complex analysis doesn't make it more complicated and therefore harder. It actually makes it more coherent. It makes it possible for us to make the progress that we need to make. Partly because we come to the conclusion, rightly, that no one analysis is better than any other. Don't reduce everything down to one perspective. That's the spherical approach. Allow this multidisciplinarity to flourish, because in that multidisciplinarity, all of the people at the table will be able to do something to make a contribution to our care. Thank you very much.